um, defining risk and where that we as bankers can apply our limited resources to trying to track down um, money laundering and terrorist financing. So uh, as uh, I told um, Vikas earlier, it's, it's wonderful to have um, a quant geek here as long as he's not working for the Cleveland Browns draft team. Uh, so, so anyway, and in the middle is uh, Alec Al Kamwahi, who is um, on the Case Western uh, faculty, and Alec is uh, a legal expert in the fields of corruption and anti-money laundering, especially in um, the Ukraine, and besides that, um, he has introduced me to some wonderful vodkas. So with that, uh, one of the things you need to know about these Thursday night AML Unplug sessions, we don't want any canned prepared speeches. We want the speaker to talk about strictly what is on their minds, what keeps them awake at night, and uh, what they think we can benefit from. So with that, I will turn it over to Alec, who will moderate tonight's uh, session. Uh, we will leave this microphone down on the floor. If you have any questions you would like to ask the panel, please feel free to come up and uh, ask the question, interrupt them, and be as pointed and or as conciliatory as you feel fit. So with that, it's another AML Unplugged session. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Um, for those of you who have seen me at the uh, lectures, uh, uh, case, you probably don't know my whole story, so I'm going to do it very short, uh, so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I was born in Russia, of course, you know that, and uh, I danced with uh, the hero uh, uh, a late night for a while. Younger, came back to the States, of course, from that uh, LA company for a while, for an and now I am opening, of course, uh, but uh, at least I'm opening a little bit higher uh, based on the experience uh, that I have. Uh, the topic today, thank you, I will, but I had an injury, I cannot do it. So the topic today, of course, is customer onboarding. So if I will come in, of course I can come in with a certain accent and try to explain to the bank who I am. Uh, let's see how far this story goes and what are the lines of defenses that the banks have in place to uh, preclude it, uh, preclude this type of activity from uh, the very beginning. On, on my left, of course, is uh, Willie Daddix, who is currently a senior vice president with the, uh, and, uh, the business risk and compliance program manager for the Fulton Financial Corporation. She has a very long history, as Bill mentioned, uh, vice president at he and a long, long history of uh, compliance and regulation for uh, she has an MBA from the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, she is CPA, uh, uh, CRCM, uh, KLM, and what else? <laughs> yeah, KKMs, uh, and all that. On my right is uh, Vikas uh, Agarwal, who is actually a graduate of uh, Case Western Business School, uh, went to New York, got an MBA from Columbia. Uh, Young, yeah. uh, for a while, and then a major uh, financial services, uh, and now he will be the vice president of PwC. Okay, PwC. Okay. Uh, uh, the guy who screwed up the Oscars. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, his his major focus is uh, uh, actually a technology the implementation of and big data uh, uh, processing in the field of compliance. So, with the going back to the, the notion of uh, um, uh, 
supporting clients. Uh, the first question will be to Willie, who is uh, who's been with the large banks and the smaller banks. Uh, and the question becomes, what is the difference between how the big banks want to work clients and how the smaller banks want to work clients? And what both the big and the small banks do in terms of preventing a stupid story like Kirov and Matt. Yeah, I could come to throw chip and bits, you know, in the middle. Thank you. Let me see the dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say that the difference probably comes down to how you build the big structure. Uh, because as we all know, the requirements for the AMLs, the IP program, is the same across the board. Whether you're a community bank or you're a large bank or support a large bank. Is how you execute it more than likely. Um, so the approaches I'm thinking about are centered around it being centralized versus it being in every line of business. Uh, it being centralized, you have a centralized group within your uh, most typically your corporate compliant unit um, that will onboard your customer. They're the one responsible for gathering the client information, uh, doing their due diligence with that piece of it. Uh, on a shared services based for a centralized approach. The other way is to have each line of business within the organization perform design their CIP according to their own procedures, if you will, policies and procedures. And that's where you get into the individualized approach. Uh, with the individual, individualized approach, you can run into some inconsistencies. So what we see for shared services model is that you do gain some efficiency, but guess what, guys? They also can gain efficiencies in the cost structure with it being centralized versus repetitively repeating it across you know, 14 or more lines of businesses that way. Um, and you also have the opportunity to get to see some nuances that might be happening um, if you get a share of my versus in um, The goal is the same uh, to onboard good quality customers. You know all about them. Um, per se, you understand what their uh, their, their their foundation is, uh, whether they're coming to you, their social funds, etc., around that piece of, and the expected activity uh, around what you can expect them to deliver into your accounts, per se, uh, and then the buying piece of that. So it's mostly around how a large bank, a regional bank, or a community bank may want to ex decide how to execute their program, uh, and then with their board of directors be on board with that, agreeing with that, uh, that alternative that makes sense, given their business cost model. And I would also think probably their strategy of how they might want to go about and uh, obtain customers in that regard. So the follow-up question, bro, is to you. Is it possible to automate the process of onboarding, at least at the initial stages? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think if you look at a lot of uh, companies who are out there, especially on the fintech side, that are more doing kind of faster payments that are doing peer-to-peer -peer money movement and lending, I mean, there's no longer a business where people are face-to-face -face at all. And all of the processes are done online, you're filling out forms, and there's not a lot of humans behind what those things, what's happening after you fill out those forms. So when you look at the onboarding processes for a lot of those companies, Everything on the back end is now happening on an automated basis where they're collecting the data and the information they need, they're cleansing that data you know, in an appropriate way to make sure that the data is the right information they need and then putting it through checks, whether it's go-back checks, negative news checks, um, you know, and then risk scoring and you know, what that looks like. And we're seeing that happen in a more seamless and different process these days. Yeah, we were sitting there uh, about the outsourcing. So, if it's automated, then it's something that will become it's a cost more and more outsourced outside of the bank probably there are going to be clearing houses for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we when you look at, especially when you look at negative views and perhaps we're seeing a lot more kind of outsourcing when it comes to that process where people are 
giving that data and getting the results back, you know, outside their bank versus setting these up in their bank. And then, you know, I think that people continue to talk about the concept of utilities and creating utilities around knowing your customer and almost having that driver license vehicle for AML. Now it's not there yet. I think it's still it's quite a way from becoming a reality, but we know that's a major push for the banks that um, they don't see the purpose of why a CDD process for the same person or the same business or the same institution will be done multiple times across multiple points. So, do you think the KYC process will get away from the human interaction? And you know, when you have a customer sitting across from you, you get that feeling easy or easy feeling, or whether you have a follow up question or not, it's all going to be scripted and automated. Um, I think the industry is trending that way for it to be automated, um, especially as uh, institutions look at uh, their checking processing. What can we get from end to end and then creating efficiencies within uh, the process itself? There are still, however, a population of consumers where your face-to-face uh, may be required at some point in the transaction along the way, uh, initially getting you onboarded um, in an automated, seamless fashion um, is, is trending. Um, but I also still think that there will be an opportunity uh, for businesses to sit face-to-face -face with the customer. But um, in some businesses, I know the customer prefer to do, depending on the generation of the customer, that they prefer to do things more, uh, as more technology in a uh, So with that um, certain risk, of course, then we just need to mitigate those risks there. But um, as we look to, as the test has said, um, to automate and look to the customer experience along the continuum, um, I do see that happening uh, for the industry, um, some at a faster clip than others. Um, because some banks are, if I'm correct, uh, I believe that some banks are just an online bank where they, they don't have a brick and mortar. So then how do they satisfy their CIP requirements, their KYC, their CDD, and their customers? Uh, a big question. But it's something that has been addressed already, but it would probably take a better faster pace, especially with the FinTech technologies and that's things. You know, FinTech, we didn't hear about that because I'm not aware of this happened 10 years ago. Okay. Um, or we start to get out some other things around the box and stuff. Uh, it wasn't happening a few years ago. But as we continue to increase in our technology capabilities and be innovative in this space, um, and I think we'll continue to get there. So do you think that uh, the questionnaires, the online questionnaires during the onboarding process will become more developed and, uh, and tailored uh, based uh, and more interactive in, uh, in, uh, when the question is asked and a certain answer is given online, then the questions that follow will kind of be adjusted to the previous questions and will expand. Yeah, I mean, uh, which absolutely. I mean, I think already at bigger banks you do see that some of that you see based on the income level, based on what your geographies are, the type of questions that they ask you. You know, are different when you're onboarding onto different types of accounts. If you're opening up a brokerage account or opening up a Roth IRA or you opening up even personal, uh, personal banking, we see a lot of new. And we even see a lot of business models evolving right now where um, you know, Goldman Sachs is getting into this business as well as larger banks where they're trying to revolutionize commercial banking um, to be able to give loans up to a billion dollars to companies on an automated basis. So I think you're going to see this trend the same way that you talked about that kind of, I think millennials don't want to sit there and interact with people. I think millennials who are running businesses and want to get funding and loans also don't want to interact with people. And I think from that standpoint, we're seeing bigger institutions also take a very non-face-to-face -face approach to how they onboard those customers. Let me ask you just one follow-up question. The interesting thing that I've read, and I forgot how it was, it was that you can the light detectors uh, have been implemented in the telephone systems when you respond, um, the, the, the voice recognition part of the voice recognition system has a component of the light detector. So if the bank asks you, say, what is your name, and you answer, my name is Joe Smith, the detection uh, is immediately there whether you are truthful or, or, or a light user. So it, do you think this will become part, standard part of the procedure of the uh, uh, of the onboarding process? Because 
in the regular onboarding process, we relied on the officers. The customer said in front of the officer, and the officer said, you know, what's your name? And the guy said, my name is Joe Smith, and then, and yeah, Joe Smith looks like a woman. It, you know, the red flags go on, right? And here, when the uh, light detector kicks in, it kind of provides an additional to you see more and more that happening. And whether if you see that more and more happening, how intrusive is this? I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I can tell you from working with four or five major banks that, I mean, the customer experience or the surveys that they fill out is that nobody wants to answer all those annoying questions about what your favorite pizza topping is and where you went to school. Um, from that standpoint, so wh where they've been evolving is to kind of voice voice footprints and voice authentication as well as face authentication. And a lot of banks have put into place, I know three or four major banks that have that have put in place voice and two that have put in place face authentication where with your phone, they can essentially create that as a fingerprint now um, where you can use your voice or your face to be able to authenticate your account, to authenticate who you are. And in addition to that, a lot of call centers are including kind of this lie detection technology that measures your voice and measures certain signals in your voice to help them detect fraud as people are looking at different things. And, that is becoming very commonplace. But I, I will say every consumer survey that we take is that, you know, people, I, I don't think people mind it if it creates a better user experience for them. They don't seem to be against the ability to do that because on their side it's almost seamless. Unless for some reason they're being detected. But the technologies are pretty sophisticated such that there's not a lot of false positives coming out. No. Okay, uh, I've just got uh, uh, a sort of out of the box question. If the questionnaires that, that come over through the internet and so forth are, are uh, bound to be flawed, and the, the answer is uh, possibly uh, false, what is, is, after we've onboarded the client, what is the development of algorithms or whatever that will look at the transactional activity of that client who said he was uh, 42 years old and a carpenter and blah 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 and blah 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 he says his activity is way out of the norm of that person is is there any development going on in developing those types of uh, algorithms that can give us a Better, better handle on is the person who said he was XYZ, is he acting like he's XYZ? I mean, absolutely. And I would say it's going even further from a point to, you know, I think for a long time the transaction monitoring has been happening and you're comparing business activity to what the person's filling out. Now, I, I think it's even going a step further than that. Um, I can give you an example of a client that we have that they automatically take addresses that are filled out and they search those within Google Images and they're able to scrape the Google Images to determine the type of business that they're seeing in the image from an automated place and compare that to the business activity. So, for example, you know, we detected a case using these algorithms where it was a correspondent banking relationship where they had money coming in over $60 million, and when they scraped the Google image, it was kind of a threaded needle shop in Zimbabwe. And the, the activity didn't make sense at all. Now, of course, the person didn't say they were that type of business in terms of what they were coming on as. This was a KYCC situation, so they had limited information to begin with. But to your point, technology is there now where they just send out a bot to automatically scrape these images to look for patterns in the images that would look suspicious, to scrape down what metadata would come off of these images, and then use that to compare that to the transactions that are happening, and that's allowing them to be much more sophisticated in how they detect fraudulent activities. Okay, that's, so the technology is there. To, to Willie, uh, to what degree is this being implemented, and how are the regulators looking at this? Technology is not there yet. Technology is being developed and evolves as we go. But some of it is in place, uh, some of it is more sophisticated in the hands of uh, the price okay. of the house. 
that gives them an opportunity to just pull out the Oscars like this did. <laughs> and some of them in the smaller banks, it's out there because it's very expensive. And to find an outsourcing relationship probably becomes, or partner relationship becomes an issue that needs to be researched. Um, I would tend to agree with that also. Um, I would also say that from a regulator's perspective, I would look to what they are now doing in the space of uh, fintech. Uh, so we kind of get a gleam of what might be to come from them. Uh, I currently don't have first-hand experience in uh, sitting down with them yet and talking about that. But given the uh, proposed regulations around fintech and charting them, uh, which is met with uh, some criticism by various stakeholder groups, uh, that might give, give us some insights into where this might potentially go and how fast it might go. Thank you. So the question I'm going to to you is how fast will it develop? And where do you see the onboarding process um, in terms of automation, in terms of all those bells and whistles, say, in two years, say, in five years? You know, I, I think like anything else, like things develop where the greatest need is. Right? So wherever the greatest pressure is and wherever the greatest need is, you know, that's where people are going to innovate and that's where people are going to spend money to innovate. So I think when you look at the bigger banks, like for example, when you have a bank that was spending $1.3 billion on a and compliance, their CEO would say, I have a need to innovate. I have a need to reduce my cost to my customer and they are going to, they are willing to spend 100 to 300 million to reduce the $1.3 billion spend, you know, very significantly. Now, on the other side, you know, I think to your point, on smaller institutions, it's only going to happen through some type of consortium, through some type of hub, through a one-to-many model for them to be able to access technologies like these because they're clearly not going to have the spend or the will or the desire to even spend that money because the necessity may not be there. Then it may take time for it to kind of evolve to get to that point. Unless some regulatory requirements will come in, yeah. have to have. Unless the regulators kind of force it. But I, I would say I don't see we don't see the regulators kind of forcing prescription like that right now at least. I would also say that um, it also depends on the strategy of that corporation, what their vision is, and what they want to be known for. Um, for some of the large institution, um, for instance, I think for come to mind, I, I want to say JP Morgan Chase, they have a um, innovative research um, arm there, I believe, if I didn't misread something about that, where they're, they're kind of out there, if you will. Um, but it depends on if being first in the market to deliver a solution like this is critically important to the institution they want to be known as that, then, then they'll get there. Um, and, and cost, um, probably put within their budget in order for this to be uh, achieved, if you will. Uh, some institutions, they have a more um, relaxed approach, or I should say relaxed, but a more conservative approach to it. But we don't want to be the leaders out there in this space. We would like to be a quick follower, follow on, or maybe even moderately follow on, once we can see how this has developed, uh, get some of the kinks out of it per se, kick the tires, and then we would closely follow on. Why do we follow on with partners per se with that? First off, I'm going to apologize in advance for this kind of geeky question, but it's the bane of my existence. Can you just talk about what you're seeing across the industry as well as how to balance the customer experience, the KYC onboarding, and model validation of initial customer risk ratings since you might have you know, 100 different questions then becomes 100 different variable models? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I will say, look, from a customer experience standpoint, I think everybody's trying to figure that out right now. I think the customer experience has only gotten worse from an AML standpoint. And AML requirements have continued to cause banks to be more intrusive than they like to be with their customers in terms of the number of questions that they ask, in terms of the number of diligence that they have to do, the follow-ups that they have to do. And I think that's still something everybody's working on to figure out how to balance that the right way. And I think this is where you know almost AML is becoming a competitive advantage if you can figure out ways to do things smarter and better and faster. Um, from a model validation standpoint, um, you know, we were discussing this in the course today. I mean, from a customer risk story standpoint, I will tell you, everybody does it differently. And that's one of the fundamental problems that we see is that when you look at there's no one customer risk scoring model 
that's different than others. And you would say, well, the customers are the same. So why would a model be different in terms of how you score those customers? And I think until the industry can come together and kind of standardize some of those processes, I think you're going to continue to see CRAD and other kind of fonts from the regulators come in and pick off people one by one on material weaknesses. Now, I think the biggest weaknesses we see in the models that we have, number one, a lot of still data quality issues at the core in terms of not having enough front-end controls to get the data in the right way, even when they're onboarding customers and making sure that data is right. And then the second is being able to justify how they're setting their thresholds and making sure on the customer risk scoring on what's high, medium, and low, and maintaining that the right way. We still see a lot of people having challenges with that. Uh, kind of forgetting about civil rights, uh, the data sharing uh, is one of the keys. That um, I mean, it, it, it will happen one way or another when uh, uh, the data about individuals and corporations will be uh, shared. If you don't have to repeat by asking the same questions, you can kind of give your social security or whatever number it is. And certain data that was available before that did not ask the same question. Like if you go to the same bank and you've been a customer there for a while, they don't ask you the same questions, so they basically say you won't know it. We're going to give you that account and everything is processed automatically. So when between different banks and institutions, that this that is probably going to happen one day. It will probably happen one day, but I will first say that you probably need to have it within the institution itself before you go on slide. I don't know if you can share that and give us some privacy concerns. Uh, but that's one of the efforts that uh, I'm, I'm with now is to we'll try to look at that. Uh, so, so how we can reduce the redundancy, if you will, uh, of the customer being impacted in an adverse way. And when you come in, you know, when was the last time your account was updated, your profile was updated? So that we would know what time when, and we would know what is still outstanding that needs to be addressed from the customer. So if they went online and made some updates and changes, then we don't come back to them and say, now you're in front of me, I'm going to ask you all the more again. Uh, because that does lend itself to a very unpleasant customer experience for both the customer and also the employee in the bank. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. <laughs> um, next May, there's a new CDD rule around beneficial ownership that's going to affect that requires 25% reporting of beneficial ownership. But I've heard that the regulators are actually looking for something a little more stringent, perhaps like 10%. Are you finding that across various banks, banks are generally gearing up for a 25% beneficial ownership rule or something a little bit more heightened? I would say what I'm hearing um, is for those who don't have, first of all, um, have not implemented the best practices around it, so they would have that 25% threshold. Uh, for those who have demonstrated and went ahead around their customer due diligence at a 10% level, and you now have 25%. So the question is, can I go from, who's it mean from 10 to 25? Can I go from 10 to 25? Do I have one, two, three on that? I would say we will probably need to, for the most part, have a very good rationale as to why you're going to go to 25 and not stay at 10, because 10 was your practice. 10 was your agreed upon targeting you know, about that. Um, but, but I think if you uh, put into you know written form and this is why you chose to do that, um, and your board and your management understand that, is tell very the story, um, then you might be okay. But I mean, I mean, this is what I'm hearing so far with that. Um, I'm going to go into the closing round before the questions. I'm going to ask both of our guests uh, this question. Um, the future of AML, um, uh, customer, and customer onboarding, etc. What do you see like going to happen in the next year? Uh, what's going to be something new, something cool, something in your mind that nobody has seen before? And same question uh, to you. I mean, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing that I think is going to explode this year is just the idea of implementing more robotics into the process. So you're going to see kind of the bots take over, I think, what some of the humans did and, and not necessarily take the human out, but I think this idea of augmented intelligence where people spend a lot of time information gathering, a lot of people spend a lot of time doing searches and screen scraping information essentially and then putting that together to make a decision 
you know, I think technology over the last two years has really evolved to allow people to implement things that with a low IT footprint that can do those tasks for you. And I think that's going to really um, change, you know, how some of these processes work in terms of automating these processes and flipping people from spending 80% of their time gathering data to hopefully 80% of their time actually synthesizing information that's given to them. Um, and I would say on a community bank level, it'll probably be at a, a slower pace uh, to get there on an automated level. But I do see them looking at their cost structure and trying to see where they can gain some efficiency, better efficiency um, in a centralized unit per se uh, versus how it might be done individually today. Um, and I think eventually getting there uh, on the automated side at the smaller bank level there. But not, probably not out of the gate for them, um, given uh, budget constraints and the capital consideration. But I believe you that they, I think they would really be following what's happening on a large bank size scale uh, very closely about that. Unless there are any questions? Okay, just uh, one last, last thing before we break up tonight. I want the certificates are here on the table. Uh, May 17th, uh, 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock at Notre Dame College, Dr. John Zdanowitz uh, speaking about trade-based money laundering. And I have a very important announcement that David Speck, Speck, has just passed his uh, ACAN certification, and so uh, he is now one of us. Thank you. Thank you.